Let's take our Bibles and let's go to to uh, Second Samuel. Go to Second Samuel. Appreciate everybody being with us this afternoon. Appreciate God giving us a good message from his word this morning. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it preaching it. I did. I like it when God takes over. I do. I'd rather it be that way than any other way. I know some preachers, uh, and I'm just going to be dead honest with you, I know some preachers with some pretty inflated opinions of themselves. And that's really a shame because if every preacher would be honest, and there are, there are some that are, um, they would have to admit before everybody just how dirty, rotten, low down they are. Preachers are not anybody any different than anybody else in this world. God picks them, I think, because they are weak, not because they are strong. God is the one who then is strong in them. And um, their strength and their help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. And uh, it took me a while as a young minister... Um, to really understand that uh, the right way. Um, when I became pastor of Bethel Church, um, I was 30 years old, and um, I was glad that I was 30 years old because I hated my 20s. I hated them. When I look back, I still hate them. And um, so when God, when I turned 30 in May 30th of 1996, uh, it was that November that God allowed me to step inside the pastor's office and um, assume the role of pastor. Uh, it was not something that I wanted, even though I was like an assistant pastor, I didn't want it then. And we actually formed a committee. You remember that, Rose? I think you were on it. We formed a committee to find a preacher. And one of the, uh, one of the preachers that we tried out, he, I don't think he ever preached for us. He had a meeting with us. His name was uh, Brother Steve Reeves. And I've known Steve Reeves for years. He's a great guy. Him and his wife were missionaries. Uh, I think they were missionaries to Spain at one time, and um, Steve, like I said, was just an outstanding guy. Just You just didn't find any better than him. And so we called him. He said he was looking for a church to pastor, so we called him, and we had a meeting with him. And we asked questions, and he asked questions, and so on. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but when him and his wife drove off after leaving that meeting... Uh, he told me later on, he said, my wife and I got in the car and as we were driving up the driveway to get on American Legion Drive, he said, we both looked at each other and said, Mike Hogger is supposed to be pastor in that church. He just don't know it yet. They did. They said that. And um, one guy that we called, um, I can't remember his name. And if I did, I probably wouldn't give it out. But um, he was looking for a church. And I said, okay, well, he said, he said, be honest with you, I'm actually looking for one in your area. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, I'm looking for a church uh, be down that way because my mother is in a nursing home. And um, she, uh, I, I want to be there close to her and so on. And I didn't get really mad about that, but I just, it, I just said to myself, I think that's the wrong reason. I think it's the wrong reason. 
And so we didn't, uh, we didn't interview him. We didn't talk to him much. Um, one pastor, I remember, he was looking for a place to retire. And I'm going, well, okay, you take this church and you're going to hang on to it till the very last and then you're going to leave it by retirement. And so no, nobody sounded right. Nobody sounded like they were, nobody called and said, you know, I have had your church on my heart for the last couple of years. I know what's gone on there with your former pastor and I just have been hurting for you guys. I've been praying for you guys. And, and um, you know, I just want to come and preach a couple messages for you and, and just let you know that I'm, I'm praying for you and I hope God works everything out. Nobody ever called us with that. So we just basically, we stopped looking. And um, God kind of grew me into the decision to, to stay. But uh, anyway, I'm glad that he did. And um, so that way, in case my mom goes in a nursing home, I'll be close. It'll be a church I can retire from. And No, I'm just kidding. All right. Um, what did I say? Second Samuel chapter seven. Uh, I feel led to do this and I'm going to do it and um, teach you what I've learned. Um, and I'm going to teach it. I'm going to teach it to you why I learned it. All right. Uh, the target verse is verse uh, 14, but I want to go back. Before that, I want to go up to verse 12. So I will very generously put that up on the screen for you, verse 12. And this is, this is God now speaking to who? Does anybody know? Who is God speaking to in this passage? No, not Jesus. David. King David. King David wanted to build the temple. Uh, but God wouldn't let him do it. For what reason? Huh? No, not for that. Do what? Thank you, Mama Michael. By the way, she's got a birthday. Before, at the end of this service, we're singing happy birthday to Mama Michael, all right? But, we're, I mean, she's dead on. His hands were full of blood. God, because David was a warrior, David's job was to, was to destroy the enemies that Israel had. So he was a warrior. So, and, and I want you to picture this in your mind. That David and Solomon are a picture of the first and second coming. At the first coming, Christ is, is, wants to set up the tabernacle of God, the temple of God, but he can't because he's a warrior and his hands are full of blood. And he's all about defeating all of the enemies. Meanwhile, Solomon, or as they say in Hebrew, Shlomo, Shlomo, his son, Solomon sounds wiser, doesn't it? Shlomo sounds like an idiot. You Shlomo, you. No, Solomon, Solomon is Christ's second coming. Because there's a number there. The number is 1,000. And in Solomon, what does that number represent? 700 wives, 300 concubines. 1,000. Solomon represents the era of peace because Solomon didn't have to fight any battles. And when you don't have to fight battles, then you've got a lot of time on your hands to handle 1,000 women. So he has 700 wives. I heard that, Chris. Whew. Yeah. 700 wives, 300 concubines. And he had to handle all that. Okay. And, uh, 
And we know that Solomon wasn't perfect, but Solomon represents the era of peace. Um, we know that other nations came and brought gifts to Solomon. And that was, those gifts were given to Solomon because they didn't want Solomon and his armies, who were raised up by David, to go and kill them and take over their, their kingdom. So they knew then to pay a tribute to King Solomon. And that was a tribute guaranteeing we're at peace with you. You be at peace with us. We don't want you coming because we're probably going to lose. So Solomon represents the second coming of Christ where he establishes peace and, and Solomon gets to build the temple of God. Okay. And that's what that's a, a picture of. So now. In verse 12 of 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, and there's a, there is a, uh, a second witness to this. The Bible says, And when thy days be fulfilled, concerning David, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee. Now there's two men that fulfill that. One of them is Solomon. The other one is Jesus. He being the seed of David and the seed of Solomon. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build an house for my name. And I will establish. Remember that there's a three letter prefix for a lot of our English words. Statute, state, status, stat, establish, um, stadium, stage, stars, and that STA or STE, step, um, STO, stop. They all deal with a word that implies um, it's there and it's not moving. A statue is put in place and it doesn't move. A statute is a law that is not changed. It is a statute. It doesn't bend. It doesn't change. It doesn't move or anything like that. A stadium is where people go and they sit down and they watch a show or whatever. And so on and so on. But that's the, that's that root. S-T-E or S-T-A or S-T-O. The word stop comes from that. Stop is a stop sign. And we stop. We stop our steps at the stop sign. All right. Now, uh, he will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father. And he shall be, notice this. He shall be my son. Look at that. So he's speaking of Solomon. Then of Christ. Now, if he commit iniquity, if, now we know Jesus didn't, but did Jesus get punished even though he had not committed any iniquity? Sure he did. I will be his father, he shall buy me. So if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. So think about what Christ went through. They literally put stripes on his back with the scourge. And even though he hadn't sinned, he took upon himself the sins of all mankind. So that, and, and it was your sins. So that when it comes time to dish out the punishment for what you did. Because God doesn't believe in double jeopardy. And he never ever puts anybody in double jeopardy. We can rightfully say our sins have already been punished they were punished on Jesus Christ he now has taken our chastisement away from us by his stripes we are healed so 
Speaking of Solomon, then it's speaking of Christ. So we'll chase him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Verse 15. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So now we have a question. And this, um, I've taught this before under the idea of can a saved person continue in a sinful pattern or a sinful life? Can a saved person do that? Truly born again. Okay. My answer to that is he can sin for as long as he can bear the beating that he's going to get. And trust me, the beatings of God are things that when he does them, we never, ever, ever want to get back into that sin ever again. Make it so distasteful. Uh, turn to Psalm 89. And I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate the story of my Uncle Jay. I liked my Uncle Jay. I thought he was a neat guy. But I didn't know this because I, I never saw him. But he was an over-the-road truck driver. And um, he was a chain smoker. Bad smoker. Smoked everything, smoked all day, you sit in the cab of a truck, what else is there to do? You can't play tic-tac-toe, can't, can't watch TV, you're driving a truck. So he smoked. And he finally, I guess his health started getting bad or whatever. So back then they didn't have the patch or the gum this is back in the early 80s, I think. So he went to this clinic. And this clinic, as part of his therapy, you know, they're going to they give him, I don't know what kind of medication they gave him. And they gave him, uh, you know, some talks, you know, some, somebody t teaching him about cigarette smoking and how to kick the habit and so on. But then they had a, a physical thing where they would take a one of those big silver bowls, you know, like you, you mix stuff up in. And they filled it with cigarette butts and ashes from ashtrays. And then they would take a, a spritz bottle and spritz it all down and, and just make it wet. Nothing smells worse than that. Okay? If you've ever cleaned ashtrays, you know what I'm talking about. So anyway... They put him in a room and made him sit with his head over that bowl of wet ashes and cigarette butts. And then they put down 10 Lucky Strike cigarettes. No filters. Pure, unadulterated tobacco. And everything that goes with it. And then he was supposed to light one with his head over that bowl and suck it down as fast as he possibly could suck it down, light the next one from the first one, put the first one down in that bowl and then smoke that second one down as fast as he could go. Light one off the other, one off the other, one off the other. At some point, I don't think anybody ever made it to 10. At some point, you have had so much of that. He said, I thought my shoes were going to come flying out of my mouth. He was puking so bad. And uh, there was a guy that I used to work with when I worked for Rondagonia. And he was trying to kick the habit. And I told him that. And see, he said he went home and tried it. And he said, now I didn't quit smoking, but they sure taste different. So, well, okay. But the idea is supposed to be that when you do that and you light up a cigarette, you're supposed to think of what that smell was like and how sickened you got 
from that. And of course, you were vomiting as a result of that. And that's supposed to alter the way your brain thinks about cigarettes. And my uncle said it helped because the, the next time I lit up, I'm remembering now that smell and, you know, him getting sick over it. And he said, I didn't end up finishing that cigarette. I, I put it out. And here's what I'm saying. God has a way of making his chastening so bad and so terrible in your life that you will never, ever want to do it ever again. Now, Psalm 89. Is that where I told you to go? Look at uh, verse 20. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established. Mine arm also shall strengthen him. You know when he says his hand shall be established? With whom my hand shall be established. There's 27 bones in my hand. 27 books in the New Testament. So look at that now. With whom my hand shall be established. He's referring to, I believe, the New Covenant, the New Testament, and the 27 books. Mine arm also shall strengthen him. So you have 27 bones in the hand. How many bones do you have in the arm? Come on, who knows? How many bones are there in your arm? Radius, the ulna, three. 27 plus three is, how old was Christ when he began his ministry? 30. Anyway, verse 22 the enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. Think about that, people. Um, I have not seen the devil work as hard as he's been working um, against our ministries but he is working very hard on our ministries very hard um, so just keep that in your prayers I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him and it's all about there are spirits and then there are humans that hate, they hate me. They hate me because I won't shut up about the Catholic Church, false prophets, false teachers, the true gospel versus the false gospels. I won't shut up. Verse 24, but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him and in my name shall his horn be exalted. You see that where he says, my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him? Is there a limit to that? Let's find out. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. And he shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him my what? Firstborn. That's who Jesus was. Higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy, here it is. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. Now, if we look back at what uh, he says here. 
He says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So the recipient of that blessing and the recipients, plural, of this blessing, they get the same thing. God promises, verse 28, my mercy will I keep for him for how long? Evermore. So that if you lived forever, God will always grant you mercy, which means he will always pardon your iniquities. Now, does that mean then that we can go and sin all we want to and do is whatever we want as Christians? We can go out and have affairs with women or men or both. We can go out and drink all we want. We can go out and, 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 and because it's legal now, we can go to all the pot shops around town and get as much marijuana as we want to and just get high and buzzed and everything. Can we do all of those things? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 29, his seed also will I make to endure forever and his throne is the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law, walk not in my judgments. If they break my statutes and keep not my commandments. Notice there's four things here between verse 30 and 31. If his children forsake my law, walk not in my judgments, break my statutes, keep not my commandments. Then... Will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes? That is almost identical. He said, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Identical. Nevertheless, verse 33, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Understand something about God. If God made a promise, you don't have to ever doubt whether he'll keep it or not. He will he always will then he says verse 35 once have i sworn in my holiness that i will not lie unto david his seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me it should be established forever as the as the moon and as a faithful witness in the heaven see law but basically what so here's god here with a second witness in psalm 89 to exactly what he said here to david in 2 Samuel chapter 7, is that if, if his son, God says, I'll call him my son, and if he's got a sin problem, don't worry. Because I'm going to beat him, and I'm going to chasten him, and I'm going to make it so hard, and so mean, and so cruel. That it will literally scare him out of his mind. And I promise you, he'll never want to do that ever again. Some people have it in their mind that a saved person can sin all they want to and get away with it because God has this endless role of forgiveness and mercy that never ends, it never stops, it always keeps on going, uh, and God isn't going to chasten them, He's not going to correct them in any way, shape, or form. I have read, I've read some of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. I've read... One pass, one uh, post on Facebook where somebody said that they could even take the mark of the beast and they're going to heaven. 
It's called tempting God. I, I, I don't, I would not try that if I were you. Um, I, I've told this, but I preached the funeral of a 13 year old girl. No, I didn't preach the funeral. I attended the funeral. Her dad preached the funeral, which was odd in itself. But this girl went to our Christian school the last year we had school. And um, the, the parents didn't tell me, but her parents, her dad was a pastor of a church in this area. And they didn't tell me why they pulled her out of public school, but they pulled her out of public school because she had fallen in with some girls in a group there that was like a lesbian gang. And she had fallen in with them and, of course, what they were doing. So the parents took her out and then they asked me if they could put her in our school. They didn't tell me what was going on. But anyway, while she was here, she was a good student. She didn't cause any problems at all, nothing like that. And then uh, in uh, 2008, God uh, led me to uh, close the school down, and we did it at the um, Christmas break. And he asked that she could homeschool through us through the next semester. And I told him we, we would do that. And so uh, she did her paces at home and, and, you know, the dad or the mom would bring them to us every now and then. And um, then something happened. And I know two different sides of this. I know the side from someone who went to the church and I know the side from somebody else in the funeral business that this young lady... For some reason, her dad, who was crazy, thought it best to out his daughter because he put her back in public school and she fell right back in with the same girls doing the same thing. So he decided to out his daughter on a Sunday morning service in front of everybody. 13-year-old daughter. And then that evening, their house was right next to the church. His dad, her dad and mom said, are you coming to church? She said, I'm not feeling well tonight. Okay, so they left and went to the church next door. And while they were there, she took her dad's shotgun and blew a hole in her chest. And um, that dad preached her funeral. And there was something not right about him, Chris. He was like smiling and like cheerful and I'm like okay I understand the joy of the Lord is our strength but your daughter just committed suicide how do you deal with that I wouldn't be able to preach my kids funeral so he preaches her she got say he said she got saved when she was five so therefore, once saved, always saved. Boom, in heaven. And don't ever question that. And I'm like, man, I don't think so. Six months later, that same man handed his wife divorce papers, said, sign these, I hate you. Blamed, blamed the mom for what the girl had done and took off and left. He had another woman waiting in the wings, and that's what he, that's what he did. And uh, in a case like this pastor, some people don't want God's correction, and they won't accept it. Here, God is saying, I'll make a deal with you. No matter what you do, I will always forgive your sins. The only thing is, when I get a rod out, and I get ready to go on your backside, you let me. Because I promise you, I'm doing this for your own good. I am beating you. 
Now, while my mom used to whip me, and she used to whip me with my own belt, and it was them 70s leather belts with the ringlets in them, while she was beating me, it, you know, I didn't want to hear, I'm doing this for your own good. If you want my own good, stop! But I'm thankful for every spanking I got. I probably deserved more that she didn't give to me. Now, turn to Job 5. This is, this is how God... Because I've heard, I heard preachers say that if... If, if, if somebody has an issue with sin where they repeat the sins and they, they, they can't get any victory over it. I've heard people say or preachers say, it's obvious to me they're not even saved. Now, I, I don't know the people they know, so I can't say that, yay, they were right or no, they were wrong. But I know this, that even if a, a Christian, a born-again Christian, has an issue with a repetitive sin, if God cannot forgive that and conquer it, he's not much of a God. And so, in Job chapter 5, here's what God said. Um, verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. So what does God make a promise here about? That if you let God chasten you, you are going to be happy. Amen. And not despise nor try to hinder or stop God from chastening you over your sins. After all, you ask God to take these away from you. And if you ask God to take them away from you, but you won't let God chastise you or chasten you, or even if God does it, you say, I, I'm, I'm not going to accept that. Well, you're not accepting God's love. Verse 18, for he maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands make whole. I like that. Because whenever, whenever you take a child and... and God designed a, a part of their body that has a lot of fatty tissue in it, which, number one, is not easily damaged. Number two, if it is damaged, it's not a big deal. And along with a lot of fatty tissue back there, he put a lot of nerves just waiting to be excited and that spot there, when you aim at that spot there, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, I would, I would recommend that, just that spot. I'd be careful about going down the legs, because there's not a lot of fatty tissue back there. Uh, I'd be careful about going too far up the back, too. There's not a lot of fatty tissue there. There's not much to protect the bones. So if you're going to use a paddle or a rod... Leave it with that spot that's about this big. Okay? But anyway, he maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth in his hands make whole. So God, God give you the whooping. But then, God will take his hand. Just like, just like if, if, if your mama gave you a good one. I mean, whooped you sore. But she then draws you into herself and she begins to rub the area that she just wounded. What's she doing? Huh? How? 
the, the rubbing of that area, of a sore area, and it's, it doesn't matter if, if we hit our thumb or something hits us on the arm and we, we do this, doing that releases what, Courtney? Endorphins. It's where the word, it's related to the word morphine. It's a painkiller. Your body instantly sends out morphine-like painkillers. In fact, there are people who, uh, who have, um, uh, I don't know what they're called, but they're, they're hot pepper parties. They will get the hottest chili peppers they can find, and they will eat them one after another after another to cause their mouth to just absolutely be on fire because then their brain releases all these endorphins and they get high off of it. Matthew, I haven't told you this, but I've got some, uh, some uh, uh, beef jerky on my desk that people from New Mexico gave me. And uh, I will let you have it because I ate one piece and I was angry for two hours. I mean, I was mad, angry for two hours because I had eaten that. It took me two hours to get that flame off my tongue. But anyway, let me, let me move on. We're out of time. Okay. But that's what it means there. He make a sore, he bindeth up, he woundeth, and his hands make whole. Here's God now caressing the area that he did. And what he's doing, he's releasing endorphins in you, a natural painkiller. And all of a sudden, it don't hurt as bad anymore. God, the same God who whooped you is the same God that loves you. And this is how parents ought to be. It's one thing to whip your children. But it should be followed up at some point with the hand that takes the pain away. All right. Now, turn to Hebrews 12. And again... If the, if the question in your mind is, well, if, if I'm saved and you say that I could sin all I want to, what does that mean? Does that mean that God won't do anything about it? He'll just forgive it and move on? Oh, no. Oh, no. God will love you so much. Even more so than your father or your mother. My dad never laid a hand on me. It was my mom always. Um, that uh, gave us a whipping or correction or whatever. And it, with me, it was for all, all kinds of things. Burning the tree house down. Setting the woods on fire. Throwing rocks at the neighbor's car and busting his window out. Stuff like that. Bad grades on the report card, not turning in homework and lying about it. I mean, I, I got the whole gamut of whippings, okay? I got them for everything. Here's what God said in Hebrews chapter 12, um, verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And he's talking about Christ on the cross. And everybody at the foot of the cross was contradictory to him. Lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. In other words, he's saying, if Jesus can go through this, then you can too. Verse 4, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Verse 5, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. This is what God now said to David. And what David says in Psalm 89. That if God loves me, he's always going to have mercy on me. And his mercy is never, ever going to depart from me. Which means that I can sin, ask God's forgiveness, and he will forgive me. Every single time. But does that mean I can do whatever I want to? It only means that if you can endure 
the chastening. And I promise you, God will make it worse every time. Whom the Lord loveth, verse 6, he loveth, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. By the way, it's Child Protective Services that says that if you leave a mark, that's child abuse. But that's not God. God said if you use a scourge and leave stripes on their backside, uh, and God will know whether you did it in love or not. But if you do it in love, God's okay with that. But in the world we live in right now, if there's a chance that child services might take a look at it, then you might want to be careful. But chasten your children and don't hold back out of fear of that DFS is going to take your kids away. Don't do it. It is still not against the law in the state of Missouri to spank your own children. It's not against the law. And I don't look for it to be against the law anytime soon. Verse 7, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is whom the, the father chasteneth not. But if you be without chastisement, here we go, whereof all are partakers, then are ye, and here's the word, bastards, and not sons. And that word literally means what we think it means. It means that you have no right to the inheritance. The inheritance is eternal life. The inheritance is heaven. And if God, who tries to chastise you, give you a whipping over your sins, if God is trying to do that and you won't let him, God may just say, he's a bastard and he's not my son. He cannot bear my name. The, and this idea goes back a thousand years or better, uh, or maybe 800, 600 years back in England and Europe and places like that where inheritances, you know, were important. Uh, when people own large tracts of land and so on, and who was going to get that land is going to be a certain son. But if that, if, if that son uh, went against his parents and became disinherited, then that he became as a bastard, and then the father would find someone else to give the inheritance to, which is what God did with Israel with us. He disinherited Israel and he brings us in and now we're the sons of God. And so he says, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and have given them reverence or and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection under the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. So there it is right there. God is whipping the desire of sin out of you. And he knows how to do it. Let him do it. And then he says in verse 11, Now no chastening for the, for the present seemeth to be joyous. It doesn't. But grievous, nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make, paths, uh, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. God basically laying out the doctrine that says you can sin for as long as you can take the punishment of that sin. But I promise you, even God knows when somebody's playing that game, and I guarantee you, God will get them so hard and so bad and so terrible that they literally 
don't want to be treated like that ever again. And so the next time the devil shows up and says, hey, let's go do this. Let's go do that. Hey, you know how we used to do it. And, oh, look, it's right here. I'll make it easy for you. Uh-uh. I remember the whipping I got. I never, ever want to do this again. Because I, I didn't think I was going to make it. The last beating I got. I probably won't make it this beating. You should ask my mom about the time that I crawled home from our neighbor's house. She whipped me really, really hard, but probably not as hard as I thought it was. And so it made my leg shaky. And so I crawled across the across the yard, across the street, and across our yard to the front door to make it look like I couldn't walk. That she had crippled me so bad that I, my legs didn't work anymore. And instead of her going, oh no, I think he's hurt real bad, she's going, would you get up off the ground? Let's stand. Unless, of course, you feel like you can't walk. And then everybody's just going to make fun of you. Well, like I say, I don't know who this is for, but it's a good lesson to remind ourselves that, number one, there are things that we used to do that we just don't do anymore. And that's because God, either by mercy and his love shining for us that we just didn't want to hurt God with it anymore, or... God beat us so bad and so hard that we made the conscious decision, I never, ever, ever want to go through this ever again. And um, it's a good lesson to learn. It's a good lesson to remember. Father, thank you, Lord, for this book, the wisdom that's in this book. It is the wisdom of the ages. We thank you, God, for preserving it for us, teaching it to us. We love you. We thank you, God, for all that you've done. Lord, there's some people right now, Lord, that I know about, that I love, that I care for. Father, that, that need this kind of lesson. Lord, I know, God, that you're dealing with people. I know, Father, that you just want to help. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would do that. Bless this church. Bless all the things that you have us doing. Thank you, God, for letting us serve you. We ask this in Jesus' name and amen.